excited to be in the house of the Lord today. Come on, let me hear you. Amen. Hey, what an exciting day. What an exciting day. Uh, great to see everyone here today. Just before I do anything else, I want to introduce myself. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people, this group of awesome people called Lifeline Church. Come on, give it up for yourselves one time. You're awesome, and we love you. It's amazing. Thank you for being here today. Um, I, this is something I say every single week, but it doesn't take the, the essence away. It doesn't take my heart away from it. Um, I believe that uh, some of you are here today, all of you are here, no matter if you're new, first time, third time, I don't care if you've been coming here for 20 years, God is the one who brought you here today. God has been doing something in and around your life to draw you here today for one reason, because he has something he wants to say to you. He has a message of hope encouragement, and love that he wants to speak into your life today. Now, if you believe that, say amen with me. Amen. amen because it, it takes, he's, he's speaking to us, and he has something he wants to share with you. But it's going to take a seed of belief on our end. And I just invite you uh, to come along on this journey, and, and God wants to do something amazing in your life. I, I believe that from the bottom of my heart. I wouldn't even be up here doing this if I didn't believe that from the utmost pit of my heart. So welcome to this series. It's exactly what it sounds like. What we wanted to do this is Easter, man. Easter just happened, and y'all didn't get the memo that nobody's supposed to come to church uh, the week after Easter. You all didn't get that memo because you're all holy people. You're amazing people coming to church like, Easter was last week. I ain't staying home, man. I'm coming again. I mean, you guys are awesome for that. And so I was like thinking I was going to start a series and, and have a, at least a breather where only those faithful few were going to come so I could talk about something deep, you know, but y'all are here, so y'all going to get like the best I got, so... Let's go for it. This, this series is based around an idea that, you know, we all have questions. Hey, hey, we all have questions. We have questions about God. We have questions about the Bible. And some of those questions are a lifetime old. You know what I'm saying? So um, if you're anything like me growing up, because let me see a show of hands if you did not grow up in church. Raise your hand if you did not grow up in church. I got my hand up. I did not grow up in church. So some of you, man, not, not as many as I thought. So that's all right. But you know, if you, if you didn't grow up in church, man, you, you in the cool kid club, you know, like, we're, and that's what I represent. So if you didn't grow up in church, maybe you had some questions about the Bible. Maybe you had some questions about God um, like I did. So when I, was about, when I was about 10 years old, when I was about 10 years old, my, my good old grandma, maybe some of you got a grandma like this, man, she got me a, she, she thought, man, look at that boy. He going down the wrong path. I'm, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get him a Bible. I'm going to make sure it's a King James Bible because it ain't a good Bible unless it's a King James Bible. So she got me, um, she got me one of these bad boys right here. Ooh, hang on a second. I've been working out. Okay, so I, she got me one of these bad boys right here in the King James. And, you know, if you're a 10-year-old boy, you really only want to know one thing. How does the story end, right? And so if you're anything like me, man, you just jumped to the book of Revelation and said, let's cut to the chase. What do I need to do? So I want to go ahead and read you what I, the first scripture that I ever really read and um was this is fun you need to brace yourselves right here I, I actually intentionally picked the esv instead of the king james because the king james was like in c17 i'm like I can't, I can't even bring myself to read that version of the bible in church it's well let me just read it to you all right <laughs> revelation 17 verse starting in verse 15 you know i'm just jumping to the end 10 year old boy and the angel saideth unto me the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And then the ten horns that you saw, they are the great beasts. And they will hate the prostitute. And they will make her desolate and naked. <laughs> and devour her flesh and burn her with fire. So, okay, ten-year-old boy, what I got is I got a naked prostitute getting burned by a dragon. I'm like, I think this can work for me. I think I can, like, this is going to work. <laughs> 
Now, I know, you know, I didn't have somebody in my, I wasn't going to no youth group. I wasn't going anywhere where they're like, okay, well, okay, the, the prostitute's a nation of Babylon and the dragon. But we all have questions. You know what I'm saying? Like, we all have read verses or heard things. And it's like, what does that mean? I got a couple more. These are funny, though. I don't know why. I just think they're hilarious. Sometimes you just read the Bible, and if you don't have any, you know, translation on it, it's, you, can, you can tend to, well, let's just read it. Psalm, Psalm 10, verse 15, and this is from an older version. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until thou find none. So basically, the proper treatment of the wicked is break their arms until they stop being wicked. Can I get an amen? No? No? Okay, well, let's hang on. I'm going to talk about this. One more, one more. This one's my favorite because, you know, the age of my kids and everything. Proverbs 22, verse 15, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. So basically what Proverbs is saying is the method of educating your children is to beat them until they're smart. And every parent said, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I'm about to go home quoting this pastor right now. This is fantastic. No, <laughs> Pause, please don't do that. <laughs> please don't do that. It's just talking about, you know, we all, we all should have some kind of explanations for some of these questions that, that we all ask. And so what I want to do in this series is I want to answer the most frequently asked questions that, that we receive. Because you deserve it. You deserve that. You deserve to have an answer to some of the most frequently asked questions that you may have about the Bible or that maybe your friends or your family have about the Bible. So today's subject is this. And I had to... I had to come up with a new way of saying this because it comes from a wide variety of questions. And today's topic is this, is there a spiritual world? Is there a spiritual world? And if so, how does that apply to me? Now, I had to generalize this question because it, it comes from a, a, a lot of different, are there, pastor, are there angels? Are there demons? Who is, what is the Holy Spirit? What is all this people, I've seen people speak in tongues before. Pa please, what, what is going on? Because it seems to me like, there might be more than what I'm able to see, touch, smell, and hear, but I can't quite put my finger on it. What does the Bible have to say, and is there a spiritual world, and if so, what does that have to do with me? It just seems like the unseen or spiritual side of life of faith is either one of two things happens to it. It's either, it either gets blown out of proportion, the spiritual side of things either gets blown out of proportion like crazy, or the other thing happens. It gets dumbed down to the point of non-existence. And that's something we see a lot of in, in churches and different things. You know, I get around, try and see what's going on, and, and, and I, I just hear your questions. And I see what's behind those questions because we've all seen things we can't understand, and we've, we're trying to put answers on this. And so today in church, come to church, and, and hopefully you'll have your question answered. Let me just tell you real quick about the first experience I had when I, when I realized that there was more to this world than what I could see. I remember it vividly. Um, and I've always had you know, an idea. I think we've all like walked into rooms sometimes where we're like, what the heck is that feeling? I feel like I just watched a scary movie. How come? It's like, what happened? But for me, I was working at a company called Raj's Transport. It's hard to say. R-A-J apostrophe S, like Raj is his name, and Raj's Transport. I was uh, a medical, non-emergency medical transportation driver, basically taking people to and from their dialysis uh, meetings and appointments or whatever they had to do. And that was my job. And so I, I saw a lot of sick people. I saw a lot of people in wheelchair, a lot of people that had a lot going on in their life. But there was this one lady, okay? There was one lady, and I, I get her on the lift, and I put her in the van, and I tie the, I tie the uh, wheelchair down because that's what I'm supposed to do. And there was just something about the way she was foaming at the mouth and the way she looked at me and the way she was growling at me, I'm like, okay, okay, some, some of y'all are sick, but you, <laughs> there's something, there's something extra. There's something extra going on with you. And it just was, to be honest, and maybe you felt this way, but it was just a feeling like something, something else is here. I couldn't put my finger on it quite, but I just knew there was something going on behind the scenes. And maybe, maybe you've had a situation like that. And maybe it feels a little strange to ask in public, but I'm, 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 I'm assuming that a lot of us do have that question. Like, what's going on with the spiritual world? Can you please tell me what, what it's all about? And most of us have been places and, and done that, just can't put our finger on it. So I want to uh, present you, this will be in your notes. This is a statement I want you to remember. This is from a, uh, this is a quote from a pastor named Jack Hayford, uh, a really great pastor. He's not, he was a really great pastor. He still is. 
And he said this. He said, you can't cast out the flesh and you can't disciple a demon. So assuming that, yes, there is a spiritual world. I'm, I'm, a lot of you are probably in church because you believe that statement, um, that there is a spiritual world. But Jack Hafer said it that way because of that ditch on the side of our road. We got two ditches on the side of the road. One is the one ditch that we tend to fall into is, you know, everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. You know, if I, if I, if I woke up late, you know, my alarm clock didn't go off and I'm late for work, man. That's the demon of laziness, man. Get, cast you out by Satan. I'm like, man, you just didn't wake up. Man, wait. Like you ran out of gas on the side of the road and, it's, and all of a sudden it's the Chevron demon trying to curse you. No, you forgot to fill up your gas tank, all right? You can't cast out the flesh. That means you can't say, be gone, the things that you have to do. The flesh just basically means this is your own nature. We all have to discipline ourselves and wake up on time and remember to fill up our car with gas. You can't cast that out. But the other part is equally true. The other part to that statement, you can't disciple a demon. You can't disciple a demon because some of us have experienced areas in our life where there is repetitive, let's call it bondage. It's like no matter how hard I work or try or I, I know I shouldn't do this thing, but I inevitably keep going back and back and back to it. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to disciple some spiritual attack that's coming against us. There's, there's influence or maybe there's something going on. And we're trying to, we're trying to at, uh, answer a spiritual question with a natural response. I'll just try harder. Anybody felt that way? Like, man, it's no matter how hard I try. Like, I cannot beat this issue. What is going on? It's because you can't disciple a demon. So we're going to talk about these things. I'm going to get straight to it, man. I just, I think that you deserve to know what's going on in the spiritual world and, and speak to those two itch, issues, the, the two sides of the dishes, um, the ditches on either side of the road. And there's a temptation in that second paradigm because this is what I believe largely, this is what most people deal with is the side of the, the, side of the road that's, No, everything is just, I need to work harder. Everything is, I just need to try harder. And and because there's there's a temptation to that paradigm, it's control. Like, I'm in control. Like, I can fix this. Like, every single issue that has ever faced my life, in my own strength, I can deal with. There's a temptation to that because there's safety when we have a feeling of control. But you don't have to live life very long to realize that... We're not in control of very much. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, am I talking to anybody over 12 years old knows that there are plenty of things outside of our control that we just can't, we just can't, we can't control everything in our lives. So most people know that. I want to put your heart at ease today, though, because there is, you do have a say in that. And that, that, that thinking of, well, if there's angels and demons out there and there's, a spirit, there's spiritual forces, there's actually pressure that we must be subject to that, Right? Well, yes, and you have a say in it, too. You have a say in it. You can take steps. You can do things to wait to do what we call spiritual warfare and to to say, no, devil, I'm not going to I'm not going to allow you into this part of my life. There are things you can do. And so I want to direct you in your notes. You might have these in there. If this topic in your notes is called the the heavenly realms or the spiritual world, what I want to do first is I want to teach you a few things from what the Bible says. And then I want to show us some application steps of how we can actually do spiritual warfare. So the heavenly realms, I want to talk to you about this. It's found in Ephesians 6, verse 10. If you've been around, you, you, maybe you've heard this verse before. I'm going to take a different little spin on it, all right? Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. There it is right there. A lot of people like to talk about the armor of God, but... Let me tell you, the devil is scheming against you. He hates you. He, not only does he hate you, he don't even like you. And so he's coming against you. He's got schemes. Well, that's all he's got, but we're going to talk about that. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So when Paul was writing this letter to this church in Ephesus, that's why it's called Ephesians, is because this guy, Paul, was writing a letter to this church like ours that was in a place called Ephesus. And he was thinking the same way I'm thinking. We, we need to wake up and, and we need to realize that there are spiritual forces that are against us every single day. And we need to be at least aware of those things. 
Because if we're not aware of those things, then they just have free reign over our life. It goes on to say this, therefore put on the full armor of God so when the day, so when the day of evil comes. It ain't, it ain't if the day of evil comes. It's when it comes. Man, we've all had bad days. Can I get an amen? When it just seemed like everything was going wrong. And that's not God. God's for you. When the day of evil comes, though, we want to be able to stand firm so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you have done everything to stand. So there it is right there. You have a say-so in this. You have. So it may be, it may be the heavenly world. It may be, you know, unseen, but you have a say-so in this. You have something that you can do to stand your ground. So Paul speaks in this, in this letter to them, into this letter to the Ephesians. He speaks four times about the heavenly realms or the spiritual world and the things that affect us that we can't see with our natural eyes and the things we can't feel with our natural hands. But notice our part to play, that we can put on the full armor of God and stand our ground. So we are not passive in spiritual things. We're not. You have a part to play. And number one, I can leave myself open to spiritual things. And I've done that. We can leave ourselves open to spiritual things. And number two, I can close the door to those spiritual things and say, nope, not in my house. Nope, not in my life. We can do one or the other. So let's get down to some some learning. I want you to know a couple things about the spiritual world. This is in your notes. You can write this down. Number one under the heavenly realms is the devil is is real. He is real. Now, I'm going to... I'm going to get a little theological on you. And so those of you who like taking notes and like taking extra notes, you can uh, go ahead and do that now. But basically there's three named angels in your Bible. Three named angels. Number one is Michael. Number two is Gabriel. Number three is Lucifer. So for the, for the sake of time, I'm going to just summarize really quick the, the role of these three angels. Um, the first is, is Michael, and we see him in... Um, in the book of Daniel. So Daniel, in the book of Daniel, he, Daniel prays, and we see Michael responding to prayer. We also see Michael in the book of Revelation in just a second as kind of the angel over, over heaven's armies. That's, he's a really cool guy, man. Michael, cool. But then there's Gabriel. Gabriel hits the scene when we read about him in Luke when, when there was a messenger coming to tell Mary, hey, you're going to have a son and he's going to be the son of God. Gabriel represented the word of God, the messenger of God. And in Isaiah 14, Isaiah 14, in your King James version, he, he's, he's called by name Lucifer, who was the third named angel in your Bible. And um, by the way, he was just one of those, those three angels are, are called archangels. And I believe, uh, most theolo- theologians do, and I do too, that these angels represented a kind of hierarchy in the heavenly realms. They represented like a, a, a structure where there was one, two, three, prayer, the word, and worship. We see in Isaiah 14 that Lucifer, that third angel, was a kind of worship leader in heaven. And what happened was, before any of you or I hit the scene, there was an altercation in heaven. And what happened was, so this is the original sin. A lot of people think the original sin was Adam and Eve. It wasn't. The original sin happened in the spiritual world with that angel Lucifer, and if you read Isaiah 14, when you have time later today, you'll see that Lucifer wanted to make himself higher. It was a sin of pride. He, he thought, you know, because singers are like that. You know, I can, I can attest to that. Singers are like that. Musicians can tend to be like that. You're like, yeah, that's right. That's right. Let's, yeah, let's give another hand. Yeah, that's good. And that's exactly what Lucifer did. And God said, you're gone. Gone. That's how, that's how fast it happened. He said, you're gone. So the original sin, and I believe every single sin after that, is a sin of pride. It, it, it's, that's, the, that's the original one. So every sin after that is a descendant of this pride where, no, I, I, I got this. Man, look at me. Look at me. Isaiah 14 goes through it really, really clearly. But there, that altercation, I want to read that to you in Revelation 12. Revelation 12, starting in verse 7, goes like this. There was a war in heaven. Man, I wish I would have read this verse before I read the other verse when I was 10 years old. Maybe I wouldn't have had such a messed up childhood. (laughs) There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels, there it is, fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. But say this with me. 
he was not strong enough. Say it again. He was not strong enough, and the devil's still not strong enough to take you out because we're on the right side of God. And it is not like some kind of arm wrestling match. It's like, oh, the power struggle. No, he said, you're gone because the devil's not strong enough. All he's got left is deception. He doesn't have power over you. The only power he has is the power we give him, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Whew. Two things. Two things. He's not strong enough, and he lost, and they lost their place in heaven. So that one-third, that one-third, so Lucifer and his angel because of that leadership. And this is true in even the natural world. So the leader goes, so the followers go. You know, if the leader of an organization is healthy, so are the people. And we see it in heaven that, that Lucifer fell, and his angels went with him. His angels were with him, and, that's, and, and where are they now? That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to earth. He was hurled here. And his angels went with him. So the devil didn't make God sweat. He fell like lightning from heaven. We read that in Luke 10, 18. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. It was not a fight. It was, it was just a decision that God made. Because God is creator. Everything else is created. So it's not a fair fight. It's not fair. It's not fair. But he's here now, and what is he up to? And that's thing number two I want to share with you. Number two, the devil is at war with us. He's at war with us. So the one-third of those angels came and represented a leadership structure. So when the devil fell, one-third of his fallen angels came with him. So what? They're out number two to one right there. We know that there's only one-third of them and two-thirds of us. So right there, if there was a struggle, man, it would be, be pretty easy even that. But remember, it's not a fight. There's no struggle on who wins. All the devil has is this. He wants to distract you, disrupt you, discourage you, and dishearten you so that you might take yourself out. He's a deceiver. I mean, we see that with Adam and Eve. If he could have just took them out, then he would have. But what did he have to do? <laughs> hey, you should do that. He's trying to trick us into taking our own. Don't you think if he had the power to do it to them without them having a say-so in it, don't you think he would have done it? That teaches us that he doesn't really have power over us. It's only the power that we give him. Uh, Peter says it like this in, in his letter. He says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You know, resist him. And lions don't come up to you and be like, hey, um, um, I'm pretty hungry, so would you go ahead and get on my plate right here and be like, Hey, guys, I'm a lion. What do lions do? They go, they're in the grass, you know? They're hiding. They don't want to be seen because they're not fast enough to catch their prey. They have to sneak up on you. And that is exactly what your enemy wants to do to you. He wants to sneak up on you, make you believe he's not there. And, man, when it happens, when, we're, when we think it's just us, oh, man, I just need to get better at this, or, oh, man, all that spiritual stuff, man, I don't need all that, man. I just need to try harder devil's like, hey. like he's just hiding in the grass, trying to take you out. I, I want us to be alert to this, like, like Peter was saying. We need to wake up. Deception is his number, one, his number one asset. He's a liar. He wants to deceive us and say, I'm not here. Number three, the devil does have power. The devil does have power, but you need to write this in or remember this somehow, the power that we give him. And I want to give you a verse on this, and it's this this is how we know this is true. It's also found in Ephesians, our main verse. Ephesians 4, he says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Man, we, when we, so he's just saying right here, for, for instance, in one area of our life, let's just talk about anger for a second. We can give the devil a foothold by choosing to hang on to our anger. I say, you know what? Yeah. My wife, yeah, she did that to me. Oh, yeah, he, my friend, yeah, they meant to do Just hanging on to that anger gives the devil a foothold in our life, and that gives him room to work. But what, but what the word of God, what Peter is, is writing to the church, saying don't, don't let the sun go, to, don't even go to sleep without resolving those issues. Otherwise, you're going to give the devil a foothold in your life. I don't know anybody that wants to do that. Notice again Adam and Eve, just one more time. He had to trick them into making a poor choice. He couldn't inflict that on them. He had to convince them that what God said wasn't important, that what God said wasn't the full truth, 
you know, that, that statement that he made was, oh, yeah, I know God said that, but God knows. You know, so replacing what God said to do with, oh, you know, but he loves me anyways, you know, and he does, but, you know, that's just, that goes down that line of, but we're giving the devil a foothold in our life. We're giving the devil a foothold in my life. And let me just tell you, I'm, you know, I've been around, you know, and I've been through some things, and I know what it feels like to give the devil a foothold, and I know what it's like to take a stand and say nope, and saying nope is better, okay? Giving the devil a foothold, never fun. But we always feel justified in that. We always feel kind of reassured in that. It's deception. He's given us a false sense of control, and yeah, they did that to you, so hang on to it. Yeah, you know, they're, they're looking at you funny, you know, they're putting those thoughts in your mind. That's giving the devil a foothold. Now, the power of sin entered the world through that action of Adam and Eve, but number four is this. The devil is subject to our God. The devil is subject to our God, and that's the absolute truth. First John, so John, the disciple of Jesus, wrote this to the church. He wrote it to us. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. We just learned that the devil's in the world, and so he is the prince of the power of the air, and he's got his demons with him, but the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So we can take a stand against the devil. We can take a stand against the, his works and his deception, and we can say, no, I'm choosing to believe what God said over what devil you're trying to make me believe about the people who love me. You know, usually I, I tend to find that the devil's his, his first line of attack is trying to get us to turn away from people who really love us, people who really care about us, people that don't have a problem telling us <laughs> the things that hurt. <laughs> because people who love you will tell you things, hey, I see this blind spot in your life. And the, the devil would love nothing more than to get you to go, you know what, they don't like me. They don't love me. If they loved me, they would affirm me. If they loved me, they would, they would you know, I've, I've been there. I've been there. Man, my wife says something like, you know, on a Sunday afternoon, she'd be like, honey, you know, you could have done a little better with your message on that one time. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, the devil loves to try and trip us up and make us believe things that just aren't true. She don't think you're good. She don't, but she wasn't saying that. Like, you know, little things, just really little things to creep in there, your friends, your family, the people that love you. He wants to sneak in there, but the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world and say, no, this person, they, they love me, and they've got God in them, and they do love me. He's real. He's at war with us. We have given him power by sinning. We all have, but he is subject to our God. So how do we wage war spiritually? Let's get to the fun part. Let's get to the spiritual warfare part. Let's get to the part where we actually get to see, man, how do I fight back against this dirt bag? How do I get back at this dude? Man, he coming at me, trying to mess me up. He took years away from my life. How do I get back at this fool? And that's somebody I can talk that way about. But, hey, 2 Corinthians. We get a lot of good answers in 2 Corinthians. So this is in your notes. This should be on the screen for you too. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says this. For we live in the world... But we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So how do we combat an unseen foe? How do we come against these powers that exist behind the scenes? If we are indeed in a spiritual fight and we don't fight the same way as the world fights, how do we come against these powers of, of heavenly realms? How do we do that? Number one. This is your first weapon, and it's your best one. I saved the best for first. It's the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. Now, I got to explain this, because some people might go out of here thinking, oh, I just got to say the name. <laughs> I just got to say Jesus. Oh, having a bad day? Jesus! It's like, it's like, no, hang on, pause, wait a second. I want to tell you about this. Our number one weapon is the name, it's, and it's the authority that comes with that name. You know, back in olden times, you would come in the name of King Louis, you know, if you had a message. And if you saw 300, the movie, I come in the name of King Xerxes. And, and then he'd go, he, he kicks him in the well. Anybody remember that? That's a bad movie. Don't go watch it. I'm just, that was in my previous life. But, but uh, assaulting a king's messenger 
was the same as assaulting the king. And it has the same principle. That's why Jesus used that language when he taught us this principle. There's power in the name, a.k.a. the authority that we have when we have Jesus in us. There is authority in that. There's authority in that because Philippians 2 This is a book written, again, by Paul. He wrote a lot of the Bible, and he wrote a lot of the New Testament, I should say. And he wrote a a letter to a church in Philippi. That's why it's called Philippians. I know I like to belabor that, but I want you to know, like, the nature of this word is is letters written to churches like, like you and me, like to people like you and me. This letter was written to us, and it says this in Philippians 2, starting in verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. Remember, that's what the devil wanted to do. He wanted to be in the highest place. He wanted to be the best. But no, God exalted his son to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and to the left of the earth and to the right of the earth and all the way around the earth. It's the name above every name no matter where you're at. I don't care if there's life on planet, whatever, man. It's above every name, above every single name. Excuse me, I get you got to just forgive me, all right? Just, my watch is telling me I'm in a dynamic workout right now. It just buzzed at me and said, good workout. Keep it up. <laughs> there it goes. Can you see that? It's counting my calories right now. It tells me I need to chill. Like, that's basically, was, it's like you're talking to people, okay? <laughs> Stop it. The name above every name, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, there's there's a, so let me explain how, how this works. Uh, I live on a cul-de-sac, right? And um, it's a huge blessing. And I have, a, I have a two-year-old son and a three-year-old daughter. And what my daughter likes to do is she likes to boss around my two-year-old son. You, you know, because she's a girl. And girls are, well, I'm just. What? What? Better. That was going to say better. Why are you judging me? Man, up in church judging me, man. Chill. Chill. So Emma likes to go up to two-year-old Evan and say, time to come inside. Pick up all your toys. Come inside. She likes to boss him around. And you know what he does? He goes, baby Evan. (laughs) He steps on his little motorcycle and goes like one mile an hour. He he ain't listening. He ain't listening. But here's the difference. Now, Emma can go up to little baby Evan and say, dad said it's time to come inside. You know what Evan does? He goes like, he goes, he looks up, and I'm standing there like, and then he hangs his head down like this. Because in the Jones home, the name of dad carries with it. No, I'm just playing. The name of mom is actually much more, much more powerful. But it's, it's the authority. See how she said, no, but dad said. No, but I'm not just saying this. No, dad said this, and I'm just telling you. That's what the name of Jesus is like. No, Jesus said this. I'm just telling you. Jesus has authority. I'm just letting you know about it. It's not like mine. It's not like my, my spell. It's not like my little potion or anything that works it out. No, if, if, if he said it, he's going to back it up. And in Romans 10, 13, it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So having the name as your own is available for all of his children that would just call on him. And that's good news. That means all of us can say, no, but dad said, you need to get away from me, devil. No, but dad said, you don't have any power over me. No, but dad said, and, and he is forced to flee. So the name of Jesus is not a script. It's not a potion. It's not like wing of bat, eye of newt, name of Jesus. Poof, I get everything I want. That's not what it's like. That's not what it's like. It represents authority that we have against the powers of evil and the spiritual world. That We live in a spiritual world. Now, I'm thinking that I don't really need to hammer that down. I think you know we do. All of you do. You've all experienced things that made you feel like, I know something happened in that house. I know something else is going on right here. But what I'm I'm trying to share with you is that you have weapons to fight against those things and say, no, my father said, and I have authority in the name of Jesus. So (laughs) <laughs> One th- we can try and use the name to kind of get whatever we want. And my kids do that too. Dad said, but no, dad didn't say. But dad didn't say. And if dad didn't say it, he's not going to back it up. So just remember what dad said. Remember what our heavenly father said. And you can stand on that. 
you can stand on that. Number two, this one's a little different, um, but it really hit home for me, uh, and it's, it's works in my life, so there's a lot of weapons that we have, but this is one of the three I want to give you. Number two is this, write this in, the power of music. Surprised? Surprised? The power of music. I'm being dead serious right now. There is pa- Y'all know that too. Man, it just depends what playlist is on. Kind of depends on what kind of mood you're in. Ain't that true? You ever think that there might be something spiritual there? There definitely is. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. This is crazy. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 16. So um, Saul um, was the first king of Israel, and he did good at first, um, but then he kind of uh, backed off a little bit, and the, protect- the hand of protection God had on him kind of came off, and then he was getting like spirits on him, and he was getting, he was having a really bad, t- he was getting tormented by spirits, and this is what his attendants said to do. This is crazy. Some of Saul's servants said to him, a tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician. Now, he didn't say just any musician. He said a good musician, man, because there's a difference between, like, when that music is oh, on point, it does something to us. And the Bible does talk about that. When the skilled musicians play, chains break. It, it has power. Music has power. Good music. <laughs> To play the harp, and whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you, he will play soothing music, and you will soon be well again. Verse 23 says exactly that happened. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp. Then Saul would feel better, and the tormenting spirit would go away. Saul's men said to him, bro, you need a new playlist. (laughs) It's going to take care of it right there. All you need is a different Spotify playlist. That's it, King Saul. That's all you need. I experienced this firsthand in my life, so... Um, many of you know, but some of you don't, um, and so I just want to let you guys know I do have a past. I, I went through addiction and alcoholism, and I did all that at a very young age, and I got clean around the, the age of 21, and when I was 22 and a half or something, I was, only, I was only clean for a little while, and anybody who's been with that kind of background knows that there's some, there's some stuff that gets Klingons in there you know it's up in your mind and it's like man I get so tied in circles around these thoughts because I've seen horrible things that I don't even I wouldn't even mention to you I've seen horrible things I've done horrible things and here I am barely clean barely saved and I'm sitting there in a salvation army like sorting clothes and it just starts the enemy is just starting to like spin these things in circles like a whirlwind in my mind has anyone ever been there you don't have to raise your hand or anything but just your thoughts and your mind is just out to get you and you just start spinning in a downward spiral and this feels like there's no way out you know what i started doing with nobody teaching me i just was trying to find something that worked you know what i did i sang chris tomlin to my own self looking like a weirdo up in the Salvation Army. And I, it, was, it was a while ago, so I was saying, our God is greater, our God is strong. I'm like furiously moving the clothes around. I'm just singing over myself because my mind is dark. And I'm singing over my, our God is higher than any other. I'm just going for it. And you know what? That tormenting spirit had to flee. It made me feel better. Because I, I was at work. I was in the Salvation Army. Back then, I didn't have, like, but we've got phones. we got radio stations. we got TV dials. I'm telling some of you right here, right now, it's time to change your radio station. I'm just saying, man. You don't have to. But if you want to experience some freedom, then you can. It's up to you. It's time for some of us to change what we're watching on TV because we're, we're not opening the door to the Holy Spirit to make us feel better about things. We're opening the door to a spirit. To make us feel worse. Man, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm really going long on time, but I got to tell I tried to watch Breaking Bad. Ugh, oh, man, because I was like that kid back in the, back in the day. That, and I was tried to watch like a season, because it's, you know, there's a lot of good TV out there. It's like entertaining and fun, but I watch one season. I'm like, I'm going to barf right now. I'm literally going to barf on myself. This is disgusting, and I can't handle it. And I would walk away from, like, the TV, like, mean mugging, like it was just, I could feel the difference. Has anyone ever been there? Like you could feel the difference when you listen to a certain song or you watch a certain show, I'm telling you, but the power of music. Number three, this is the last weapon right here, is the word of God. The word of God. You know, there was uh, someone in the Bible that had to go toe to toe with the devil and his trickery. You want to take a stab at who that was? Jesus. Jesus, 
was Jesus. He was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. And you know, he, he responded every time to every temptation. He responded with the word of God. I don't know, maybe we could just see how he did battle. Three times he was tempted, and every single time he responded with Scripture. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. And, man, I asked my friend for a sword, and he brought me a mean one. This is pretty cool, right? The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Our, our, our weapon looks like this, but it's not literal. It's in the spirit. And you know what the cool thing about one of these guys right here? talking about the armor of God, if I had to choose one weapon out of the armor of God in, in Ephesians 6, you know what weapon I'd choose? I'd choose this one right here. You want to know why? Because I can protect and I can attack. I can defend myself with the word of God and I can knock down human reasoning that wants to come against me in, in, with the word of God. The word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, and it is a weapon that we can use to defend ourselves, our family, our lives, and it is something we can attack the devil to make him flee from us. Oh, man, I love that so much. Ephesians 6, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the, bless, the breastplate of righteousness in place with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which is with you to extinguish all the flaming arrows. It's like the devil over there with arrows. Man, he hiding behind a poet. Pew, pew. Man, he can't even come all the way up to you. He's shooting arrows at you from a distance. Man, that's, that's exactly the picture of the devil that I have in, in my mind. I mean, he only from a distance trying to, because he doesn't want to get close to me with this thing. You know what I'm talking about? He doesn't want to get close. I think I just messed up our own carpet. <laughs> my watch just buzzed at me. <laughs> Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which is the word of God. And just like a real sword, just having it is not useful. Man, if I just live with this thing like this, because every single one of you that have a smartphone, you got the word of God too. We all got it. I need to put this away before I hurt myself. We all got it. It's a totally separate thing to use it, to learn to use it. What does learning to use the word of God mean? It means remember it. It means believe in it. It means actually use it to come against things in our own life. Like, no, the, the Bible doesn't say that about me. The word of God doesn't say that about my family. The Bible doesn't say that about my finances. The Bible doesn't say that about my health. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe what the Bible says and use it to attack the enemy and to defend myself from his schemes. Now, I know this stuff is a little deep. I know this stuff can actually make us feel like a little out of control, maybe even tense. But I want to put you at ease today. I want to put you at ease today. You, you have everything it takes to win this battle. Each and every one of you have everything that it takes to win this battle, to stand firm, to receive the Lord, and to receive all of his promises over you. Maybe you feel like you're over your head with all the spiritual world stuff. But this is what I want you to know out of Romans 8. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. I want to say that over you. In all these things, you are more than conquerors. In all these things, you are more than conquerors. You can do this. You are capable of turning things around by receiving the Lord and saying, no, but God doesn't say that about me. And I may have made mistakes. I may have lived a double life. I may, I, maybe I was close to him, but now I'm not. But no matter what, I know I can turn things around. You are not passive in this fight. You have something you can do. It's depend on him. In Christ, we are more than conquerors. You have what it takes in Christ. And, you know, that's the kicker, everybody. It's in him. Because if we don't have him, then we just lost all of our weapons. We lost, we lost all the power. But Jesus makes himself available to every single human being by what we talked about at length last week and what he did on that cross. Going to that cross and dying for every one of us and taking our sins, every sin we ever committed, every sin we ever will commit, and taking that on himself and saying, no son, no daughter, you can come home to me. You can come home just the way you are. You can come home to me. Don't worry, I love you too much to, to leave you alone after you do. But everyone's welcome. Everyone's welcome to come and, and 
let me into their life. Behold, he stands at the door and he knocks. Remember, remember this. I'm, I'm closing, but remember this. Waking up on time, staying focused at work, remembering to put gas in your car. These are things that you discipline yourself to do. All right? You can't cast out the flesh. But there may be areas of your life, even today, right now, areas of bondage, areas where you, you know, man, I keep trying to get, I keep trying to get over this area of my life, but I just can't seem to. I just can't seem to do it. No matter how hard you try, you just can't seem to get free. I'll give you an opportunity to get free today by receiving Jesus. And saying, God, I, I can't do this on my own. I want to fight back. I want to be strong for my family, for my own self, for my salvation. But we need to realize that, that we need God to win that fight. If there is a spiritual world, that means there's a, there's a king of that spiritual world. That's our heavenly father. I want you all to bow your heads and close your eyes with me because I, I just want to give everybody an opportunity. And I want to pray right now, Lord, that you would open our hearts, open our minds, and even in the midst of a potentially hairy topic where we're not exactly sure what spiritual things look like, Lord, I pray that, that the spiritual eyes that we have would be open to see the reality and the nature of these things. And Lord, in this moment, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill each and every one of us and show us the area of our life that you would have us turn over to you. So with everyone's head down, all eyes closed, I want to give an opportunity for every single person to, to give their lives to Jesus. And you don't really have to know everything about your Bible. You don't have to know everything about God. This may be your first time in church. Let me tell you, you got a one-up on the rest of us. Because you're just coming as an empty, you're coming as, a, as an empty vessel saying, God, just, just take me, just fill me up. Just do what you would do. Do what you would do with me. You have, you have the ability to right now change things around in your life. So I want to speak to two groups of people. With this, I know there's a little bit of music playing. Don't let that distract you. There's power in music. We talked about that. I want to talk to two groups of people and say, that if you've never known the Lord and never really given him permission in your life, never given him a chance, maybe you were like me and you, you read something funny or maybe someone who was a Christian did something weird and gave you the wrong idea about who God is. Or maybe you just never heard the gospel presented this way, that God loves me, he's for me, that I can actually call in the name of Jesus and be saved with my track record? If that's you today, I want to tell you, you're in, you're in the right place and God brought you to this moment right now. And I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a moment. And maybe some of us, you just know you're not where you should be with God. Maybe you used to be serving Him, used to walk with Him, but you just drifted along the way. And I want to give every single person here, if I described you in any way, shape, or form, but now is your opportunity to give your life to Jesus. Now is your opportunity to say, God, I'm, I'm here. So if that's you, I just want you to lift your hand. Nobody's looking around. Go ahead. If that's you, go ahead and lift your hand. Amen, I see you. 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 I see you in the back. Amen. Is there anybody else? Go ahead, be bold. This is your time. This is your chance. Amen. Amen. Church, can we pray as a, as, as a, as a one body, one voice? If this is your prayer today, to come and say, God, I I'm here for you. So this is your prayer. Just pray this with me. Just repeat right after me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I give myself to you. Forgive me of my sin. Make me new. Fill me with your spirit and show me the way you would have me go. Open my eyes to the spiritual world so I can be on track and move the way you would have me move. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we just celebrate? Can we just celebrate all those people that made a decision today? That is a...